this white crystalline salt that's over here. But this is not, what is salt? Sodium fluoride. This is not sodium fluoride. This is potassium nitrate, uh, which is also a salt. And uh, for those of you that uh, do your butchering at home, you might use nitrates to preserve your meats uh, and then smoke them or smoke them and use nitrates. Um, if you don't, you might want to uh, check when you uh, buy your, your ham and your bacon, and you'll see that nitrates are used for preserving the meat. So that was our business. That was my business. And I started the business in 1754, uh, the produced nitrate. Now, it also happens to be one of the three components that goes into the making of serpentine powder which you probably know as black powder today. We call it serpentine powder or blasting powder. Uh, the other component, large component, is charcoal. And we happen to have a very good location for the raw materials that's used for charcoal. Mainly what we're looking for is alder and willow trees. We make a nice lightweight charcoal. Then we cut them into two foot sections and pile them uh, in a dome-shaped pile that we then cover with earth and light on fire. <laughs> and by having it covered with earth, it restricts the amount of oxygen that goes into the wood so you get a concentration of carbon, which is what we want. That's what makes charcoal. This is what blacksmiths use, it's what jewelers use, it's what all the tradesmen that need a good hot heat, they use charcoal. And the third component in blasting powder is sulfur and we have no native source of sulfur here in New England so all of our sulfur comes from Sicily it comes by water from Sicily actually shipped in that far but uh, I have to jump back a minute and talk about the the, the saltpeter as we called it or the potassium nitrate uh, that is what was in demand at the beginning of the American Revolution because it was a component in the blasting powder. And I was the supplier of the nitrate that was used in the gunpowder in the little battle called Bunker Hill. You might have heard of that. That was my uh, nitrate that went into, into the gunpowder. And as the revolution progressed and just afterwards, I branched out of making just the nitrate and started making the powder myself. And at one point I had four gunpowder factories in Westfield and here in Southwick. Um, it's a very tricky business because as you bring the three elements together and mix them in a large version of a mortar and pestle, and the pestle is actually run by water wheels, and it, it grinds and mixes the components up. But if you reach too high of a temperature or you get a spark, it'll blow up. And they did. There were several of my mills that blew up. And as the newspapers said uh, at the time, it sent the workmen to heaven instantly. Uh, there were so many hundreds of pounds of powder that were mixing. We never found parts of the workmen. I mean, they were just obliterated uh, when the accidents occurred. Uh, also, in shipping the powder, uh, it tended to shift in the barrels as these horse-drawn vehicles went around and the entire wagon could ignite and blow up. So uh, it wasn't the safest business uh, to be in. But uh, we gained a reputation, the family gained a reputation of making high quality powder. And after I passed away, my grandchildren and great grandchildren continued in the business and they moved to New York and then to Chicago, Illinois and continued to make powder that 50 years after I passed away, my family was one of the main suppliers of powder for the and we made such high quality powder that another family that had been in the gunpowder production business since about the time of the American Revolution, you might have heard of them, the DuPonts. The DuPonts bought my family out of the business. But they continued to make powder with the Laughlin name because we had the reputation of quality. So there was DuPont and Laughlin made by DuPont. Uh, and that's, uh, that's how we started in the business and how the business grew uh, as a family. Uh, for those of you that might be doing your, your own food preservation, especially your butchering at home, 
I'll tell you how to make the nitrate. It's not a big secret. I'm not going to give you all the proportions because that is a family secret. But the first thing you have to do is you have to make an agreement with all your neighbors that you're allowed to go into the barns and into the sheds and into the cow yards and you collect all of the manure, horse manure and cow manure. And you make yourself a pile four foot by five foot by 15 feet large. Put a roof over it so it, you don't get rainwater. Rainwater is bad for it. And then you mix straw and ground limestone in with it. And you keep the pile moist for three years. And you keep it moist, not with water. Water is not good for it. You keep it moist with urine. urine? Urine. Well, I always tell people, they always ask me, what's my favorite kind? I don't want to stand in back of a cow with a bucket, do you? What's the easiest urine to get? Horse. Yeah, every, you all have chamber pots at home, right? Under your beds there? Yeah, my workmen go around with barrels and we collect, we'll pay you for the urine from your farm. And for three years, we douse the piles under cover. And what's left, the solids that are left after three years, then we leach water through that and the slurry that comes out, we heat up. And as we heat it up, it creates crystals. And they look just like table salt, but they're not a so they're not sodium chloride, uh, they're potassium nitrate. And they're actually nice and bright and white. It's a crystalline salt. It's a, a very pure product, but uh, that's the process that we would go through to, to do the manufacturing. So does that raise any questions in anybody's mind about the family or about the business? Yes. Well, once I once I started making the powder, I could make ten kegs of finished powder in a day. Now, remember, I've got nitrate leaching at you know I've got a pile that's three years old, a pile that's one year old. You know, I've got several levels, but I can make 10 kegs a day and I get paid $20 a keg. Yeah. And many farmers are uh, getting between three and $400 a year. So uh, when we can do the production, now in the middle of the winter, it's not the best conditions, everything slows down to the cold and so forth, but, uh, and your streams freeze for the water power, but still the profit, uh, the danger is there, but the profit is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay for that. Just a, you know, a pittance, but it made it, it made it worth people's while to save, of course. Otherwise, they just dump it out the window. Is what they would do.